Break out from the Kessel To say that we were not alone in the Kessel would be a terrible understatement. The Kessel consisted of the entire Spree Forest, east of a small town called Halbe, which was a place that I had never heard of before, but would never be able to forget. The Spree contained ancient oak, pine and birch groves, which stretched perhaps 30 kilometres from east to west, punctuated by small lakes, heaths and firebreak channels, where no trees grew. This whole area was alive with people with tens of thousands of people, we began to realise, as we penetrated deeper into the woods, heading west. The forest tracks bear earth roads meant for forestry wagons, not an army were full of people walking, limping, driving and riding to the west. Some were soldiers, of all ranks, insignia and uniforms, including Wehrmacht, Waffen-SS and Volkssturm, civilian defence force troops, all mingled together. The Volkssturm men were dressed in civilian clothes, with Panzerfausts, single-shot bazookas and the crude submachine guns manufactured specifically for their use. Some of the troops were wounded, and they walked on crutches, or they travelled by climbing onto any vehicle that would accept them, whether a panzer, truck or horse cart. Men slept on the decks of panzers crawling slowly along the roads, or sat on the turrets, on the track covers, or the gun barrels themselves, their heads swaying as they slept upright. Many were civilians elderly men, women of all ages, and large numbers of children, all mixed with the troops, riding or begging for places alongside the soldiers. Some of the civilians were armed with shotguns, pistols or military carbines, and walked almost like troops, with only backpacks and their guns. Others were trying to move their possessions in handcarts or wagons pulled by horses or oxen. Some refugees had brought their animals with them, and it was not unusual for our panther crewmen to jump down and clear a path through a huddle of cows, pigs or goats being driven by an old farmer with a stick. Behind our two surviving panthers, the SS King Tigers gave lifts to SS men only dozens of men on each panzer, their camouflage uniforms blending in well against the foliage and dappled light. On this narrow track, full of obstructions and abandoned vehicles, our progress was agonisingly slow, and we saw terrible sights as we passed through between the oak trees. Several times, Soviet aircraft flew over the tree canopy, firing randomly down at the forest floor, evidently not caring whether they hit anything, or what it was that they shot up. One such strafing attack sent a volley of cannon tracer tearing diagonally through the branches, ripping off heavy boughs and setting them alight. One tree limb crashed down onto a family, pushing a handcart a mother, grandmother and children, killing the two women. Their bodies were left in the undergrowth, and the dazed children took a few possessions from their cart, and simply started walking again, with no protection at all, soon disappearing in the column of foot traffic. Katyusha rockets also exploded in the trees, the shrapnel raining down on us along with splinters of wood that tore into the people clinging to the vehicles. The civilian woman acting as my guide, who was standing on my rear deck, was hit in the arm by such a splinter, and I gave her a bandage from our field dressing pack. She bandaged herself with gritted teeth, her eyes full of tears. At one point in the afternoon, we halted to add oil to the engines and allow them to cool, as the crawling progress was overheating them dangerously. We steered our two panthers off the track, and bulldozed aside several young trees to form a space away from the road without causing a break in the overhead foliage. As the panther's engine shut down, the metal clanged while it contracted, and the great Maybach unit hissed to itself in the shade. The King Tigers pulled up next to us, their engine decks emitting a haze of oily smoke, and their crewmen opened up the engine grills to allow cooling. The panther and tiger engines were of a similar design a motor unit encased in a solid armoured steel box, with the radiators in separate steel boxes on either side. This was intended to give protection from water if the panzer had to ford a river, because few bridges could take the 48 tonnes weight of the panther, or the almost 70 tonnes of the King Tiger. But this protective design caused the motor unit to overheat easily in its steel coffin, 
and engine fires were a common problem. We poured in the last of our oil, then told our accompanying infantry that we would stop for one hour. We took the chance to check our track links and running gear while the infantry sprawled on the forest floor among the leaves and scrub. On the edge of our temporary clearing, some of the men were investigating a parked car, a German Horsch staff car of the kind used by senior officers. They called us over to see what they had found. In the driver's seat, an SS officer was sitting, staring through the windshield, his head slumped against the door. He had shot himself through the temple, very recently the pistol was in his hand, and the blood dripping from his head was still wet. Beside him, a woman in civilian clothes and elegant summer dress and hat was also dead, her hands clasped demurely in her lap, her eyes shut and a cigarette between her lips. The SS were in terror of the Reds now. After the years of laying waste to Russia, the pits full of bodies, the policy of taking no prisoners, the SS knew that the Reds would show them no mercy. And why should the Reds show mercy after all? The SS had done things during their three years inside Russia which could barely be expressed in words. It was far better for an SS man to die with a bullet through his head and with his pretty mistress beside him than fall into the hands of the vengeful Soviets. There was nothing to be done about these two bodies in the horse car. We siphoned off their petrol tank, which was almost full, and shared it out among the panzers. The shadows were lengthening when we moved off again. The forest held so much life, so much death, and every angle in the track revealed new confusion and suffering. Civilians on foot called out to us endlessly, asking which way they should go, pleading for the chance to ride on the panzers. Some held their children out to us, showing us how exhausted and ill they were, telling us how far they had trekked on foot for 100 or 200 kilometres from the east. We could do nothing for these people, and at times our gunner had to use a shovel to beat back civilian men who tried to climb onto our hull. As the evening came on, my civilian guide told me that there were three or four kilometres remaining before we reached the central area of the forest. We will have to be careful there, she added. We? I asked her. I assume I can remain with your panzer, she said, as I have been helpful to your unit. How is your arm? Painful. I wish I had morphine to give you. You have none in your medical bag? My arm is very painful now. Why don't you give me morphine, Herr Feldwebel? We have used it all, madam. I do not believe you, she hissed, clutching her arm. I think you are saving it for yourselves. I said nothing, but as the panther rumbled to yet another halt, at a junction of three roadways clogged with carts and even a civilian bus, crammed with wounded. I looked at her carefully for the first time. She was perhaps forty years of age, with grey eyes that were burning with indignation. Just a little morphine, she repeated. Please. In front of our panther, an ambulance cart was stuck, its horse collapsing on its forelegs in exhaustion, the wounded troops in the wagon crying out as they were jolted by the people swarming past. I used the last of my panzer crew's morphine two days ago, I said. One of my men was hit by a shell splinter in the kidneys. It took him three days to die, but we kept him out of pain for as long as we could. When our morphine ran out, he begged me to shoot him. She wiped her nose with her hand, evidently chastened. And did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him in the head. I hope someone does that to me if I'm in that condition. But listen, I'll find you some morphine along the road here somewhere. You have been useful. The sounds of battle were loud to the south and east, and it seemed that even in the Kessel the Russians were probing at our forces and wearing us down. Infantrymen ran in from the perimeters, shouting that the Reds were forcing their way into the Kessel in groups of two or three panzers. The trees began to thin slightly, and at intervals it was possible to see the outlines of Soviet aircraft moving over the tree canopy in the blue evening sky. We tore down more foliage to drape over our hulls and turrets, and watched the sky with a desperate urgency, before we moved along any stretch of the track that was even slightly exposed. At an exposed clearing among the trees, 
we encountered a unit of three Jagd Panzers, low tank destroyers on a Panzer IV chassis, an excellent weapon, and we halted behind them while they scanned the open gap in the treetops for planes. The first Jagd Panzer moved away, surging along the exposed track and beyond it into deeper, thicker forest. The second vehicle paused, revved, and did likewise, dashing through the clearing. The final Jagdpanzer took a long time to check the sky until our troops were calling out to it to move or get off of the path. Its commander ignored the cries, if he could even hear them, and finally gave the command to move. Just as the low, squat vehicle lurched off onto the clearing, the shapes of Sturmoviks tore over us, their shadows filling the roadway. The Jagd Panzer accelerated, committed now to making a break for the denser trees, and made it halfway. Then a volley of rockets smashed down through the trees, splitting the branches apart, and struck the Jagd Panzer directly on its flank. The machine reared up into the air, crashed down on its tracks, and lost control. With smoke pouring from its grills, it veered sideways into the trees beside the road, knocking down several in its momentum and tipping over onto its side. The trees swayed and crashed to the ground, and this only exposed the stretch of road more brutally, giving the red pilots a clearer view of what was down there in the forest. Flames poured from the Jagd Panzer's engine as it came to a stop in a whirl of broken wood, its upper deck facing the break in the tree cover. The people clinging to my panther leaped off and began running into the deeper forest as everybody could see what was about to happen. Civilians, troops and medics all leaped and scrambled away from us, away from the target of the Sturmoviks. Only the civilian woman stayed, clinging to the turret rear, apparently too fearful to move, as I scanned the sky for returning aircraft. I saw none and could hear none and told my driver to drive like a devil across the clearing. It was a risk, but it was riskier to stay where we were, with the tree cover broken and the jagged panzer on fire to mark the target. I dropped down into the turret, and my driver put us in motion with a force that flung me back against the rear wall. Through the periscopes I saw the trees flashing past, and the burning panzer, with a crewman trying to drag himself out of the hatch, his whole torso on fire. Then the road in front of us lit up with exploding rockets, which ripped up the earth and trees, and sent a barrage of shrapnel over the panzer the fragments hammering on the hull as we swept over the smoke of the explosion. The panzers behind us did not delay in making their move, and in a minute, both our panthers and the two king tigers were across and moving into the comparative safety of the thicker tree cover. After some distance, we paused, and I went up through the cupola to assess the state of the hull. Around us, our troops and civilians were slowly reassembling, having run after us through the trees. On the engine deck of my panther, the civilian woman was lying on her back on the engine grills, her clothes blackened by oil fumes and shredded by the shrapnel from the rockets. Her eyes were open and she was still breathing, but the air was escaping from her chest wounds in long, hissing sounds. I lifted her and passed her down to civilians on the ground. The movement caused her a lot of pain, and she cried softly, with her eyes rolling back in her head. The capo came and stood next to me, his hands on his hips. We have to move on, he said, looking at the woman. The Jabos fighter bombers are everywhere. I promised to find this woman morphine, I said, and we have none left. She's dying. She helped us find the path. She was useful to us. The capo sighed and called for his own panther's medical kit. He took a morphine ampoule and injected it into her arm. The woman moaned as it took effect and opened her eyes. Her hands fumbled and she dragged from her pocket a photograph which she thrust at me. I took it and the woman became still. I guessed that her death was ten or twenty minutes away. At least she was dreaming. I glanced at the photo she had given me. It showed a young woman of eighteen or twenty, the resemblance to the dying woman suggesting that it was her daughter. I frowned and I put the picture in my tunic pocket as more aircraft screamed in low above the trees and the road that we had just passed over erupted in bursts of orange flame. I forgot about the photograph until much later. 
Further along the track, the primitive road was scarred with craters from recent bombing, and our progress was slowed as we had to manoeuvre past these craters among the other traffic. In many cases, the craters were being bridged crudely with planks and logs, the labour being done by the doomed men that we called Hueys. The Hueys were the Hilfswilliger, the willing helpers. These were Soviet troops who had surrendered to our forces in the good years of 1941 and 1942, when it seemed to everyone that the German steamroller would crush the USSR flat. At the time, these men were faced with prison camps that consisted of great squares of barbed wire, no huts, no tents, no shelter of any kind, no food except the weeds, and no water except the rain. How many had we killed in those encampments, while our guards looked in through the wire as the Reds killed each other and ate the corpses raw? Was it a million, or as some rumours said, was it actually two million that we starved to death? The Hiwis had volunteered to help the German armies as a way out of that hell, working for us as labourers, drivers, and in other unarmed roles. Their reward was to keep living, to eat a ration every day and have a blanket at night. After Kursk in 1943, the Red soldiers became less prompt to surrender, and those that did were reluctant to work for us. They told us that the penalty for being captured was that their families would be sent to a gulag in the Arctic. Now the Hewis in German territory were caught between two crushing forces. If they stopped helping us, they were of no further value and did not deserve a ration. Their punishment would be a bullet or a noose. Their only consolation was that the Russians did not know they were taken prisoner, and so their families were safe. But if they were captured by the Russians now, their identities would eventually be uncovered, and both the Hewis and their families would face a death sentence. What can a man do in such a situation, faced with such a choice? Some Hiwis killed themselves by whatever means they could find, while others continued to cooperate with our troops, hoping that in this way they could stave off their inevitable destiny. Their faces were set in masks of stress and fear, and their work was the work of condemned men, grim and methodical. We came upon a gang of Hiwis, which was some ten in number, men wearing a ragged mix of Russian and German uniforms and civilian clothing. These men had evidently survived years of their role, and were thin, with hollow eyes and shaved heads. They were hauling a 75-minute at pack gun by hand out of a bomb crater, as the gun crew simply stood and watched. The gun tractor was in a ditch beside the road, its engine pouring out smoke. As we passed by... Other infantry ran past, shouting a warning that the Reds were close. The trees to our left were bulldozed down, and as they fell, we saw the green snout of AT-34 pushing through them, barely fifty metres away. I could see another Red Panzer behind it, and a squad of Red infantry too, clambering over the fallen tree trunks to get to us. There were screams from the civilians nearby, as after so many years of being told about the Red Beasts, the beasts themselves suddenly appeared in the flesh. The Hiwis, meanwhile, ducked down into the bomb crater, leaving the Pei Kei gun perched on the edge and the gun crew scrambling for their carbines. As the civilians stampeded away, I went down into the turret, ordered the panther to halt, turn to face the reds and fire as soon as the gunner was able. It became a race to take the first shot. In panzer duels, the opening shot is often the deciding one, if it strikes home. Even if it does not destroy the enemy vehicle, it may damage the tracks or concuss the crew and buy precious seconds for a second shot. The task is to use a combination of the track differential to align the hull to the enemy tank and the turret traverse to lay the shot itself, controlled by the gunner's final hydraulics. An oddity of our Panthers was that only the gunner himself could traverse the turret the commander had no traversing pedals of his own, and for those breathless seconds, while the gunner rotated the great turret left and right with his face against the padded rim of the gun sight, the gunner was the most important man in the machine. The panther turret traversed slowly, but to our advantage we were already stationary, while the T-34 was still labouring over the collapsed trees towards us. Our shot rang out, the tracer flew in its red line, and at that range, our 75mm round punched directly through the T-34's turret, 
below the gun mantel. Through my periscope, I saw the red panzer recoil from the impact, and the machine crashed into an oak tree, uprooting it. The red infantry spread around the crippled panzer without faltering, and even when the T-34's turret exploded off the hull in a column of flame, then came hurtling down to crush several infantrymen as it hit the ground. Even then, they kept advancing on us. We fired from the bow machine gun, bringing down many of the reds, and at the same time my gunner was sighting on the second T-34, which was scrabbling over the wrecked trees in its eagerness to get at us. As its hull rose, we fired at its exposed belly plate, but our shot went wide as the panzer crashed down horizontally again, and we succeeded only in deflecting off the sloped front armour in a cloud of metal particles. My gunner cursed, and my loader worked like a devil to get the next round into the chamber, but as he closed the breech block, that second T-34 opened up on us. I had expected a tracer round, or high explosive intended to tear off our tracks, but what erupted from the T-34's turret was a long, straight spurt of burning liquid, an absolute torrent of fire, which spurted through the trees towards us, the splashes catching one of the red infantries as he scrambled to get clear and setting the man on fire. The man's comrades made no attempt to help him as he burned, but scattered through the trees away from the fire, moving around to our flank. This T-34 was a flampanzer, flamethrower tank fitted with a fire projector that resembled a normal gun, and its burst of flame caused so much smoke among the trees that it was impossible for a few seconds to see the vehicle itself. My gunner muttered to himself, his face pressed against the gun sight, making estimates of where the machine would exit the smoke and traversing a fraction to lay his shot there. I told the loader to have a high explosive round ready next, intending to blow away the flame tube on the enemy panzer. To our right, the Red Infantry was exchanging shots with the pack gunners and a squad of German troops who had come out from the forest, but of the thousands who must be hiding nearby in the trees, only about fifty came forward ready to defend the Kessel. As I looked back through the periscope at the smoke, the Flampanzer crashed out of the flames and charged towards us, spurting a new line of incendiary liquid that flew wildly around the forest as the panzer swayed between the trees. The fire shot past us, but I knew that if the liquid hit our rear deck, the flames would immediately pour through the engine grills and blow up our engine in an instant. We in the crew compartment would be reduced to ashes if we could not escape the hull in time. Already I could smell the stench of the Russian incendiary fuel and feel the intense heat from its flames, even through our armour plate. Our round was fired in a hurry and struck the edge of the T-34's turret, glancing off into the trees without penetrating at that oblique angle. The flamme panzer lurched forward, traversing its turret to aim its fire directly at us and elevating its projector tube to make sure that its flames poured down onto us from above. The Red Commander did not get that chance. Our high explosive round exploded on the front of his turret, and, as I had hoped, the detonation wrenched off the thin flame projector, sending it spinning off into the trees, trailing a ribbon of flames. Liquid began to gush out from the shattered gun mantle, cascading down onto the front hull, and as the T-34 began to reverse back into the trees to escape us, we landed another high explosive round in the same place. The effect was immediate. The shrapnel must have set off the panzer's liquid fuel reservoir for its flame gun, because the turret hatch blew open and a vertical blast of fire shot up into the air. All of us in the panther crew muttered thanks that this fate was theirs, and not ours. What would it be like in the T-34's cramped hull, as the entire supply of fuel exploded, sending that tower of flames thirty or forty metres high? In seconds, the flames collapsed down onto the panzer, and it was enveloped in its own fire, wedged between burning trees and sending spirals of debris out into the forest as it blew itself to pieces. The battle was not over yet. The red infantrymen, seeing their panzers destroyed, began to retreat, but kept up a barrage of machine gun fire at our troops as they withdrew. I saw that, passing the bomb crater with the pack gun perched on its lip, 
The Reds shouted and gestured in triumph as they discovered the gang of Hiwi men sheltering inside there, unarmed. Our troops began to hold their fire, perhaps conserving their precious ammunition, but also, I suspected as I watched, waiting to see what the Russians would do with their fellow countrymen in the crater. I climbed out onto the rear deck to take a clear look around and saw no more enemy panzers approaching from any direction. The burning flam panzer was still erupting in orange flames. I saw that the Russians were surrounding the crater, putting grenades down the barrel of the PK gun to disable it and firing their machine pistols down into the pit. I could just see the bodies of the Hewis shuddering as they were torn up by the bullets fired by their compatriots. I shouted to one of our infantry on the ground, a young Feldwebel, to fire on the Reds and save the Hewis, but it was too late. Their task completed, the Red infantry ran back into the trees towards their own lines, yelling and whooping in Russian. The whole forest fell quiet for a few moments, apart from the hiss and roar of the burning T-34 in the trees. I asked the infantry Feldwebel why his men had not done more to help the Hueys in the crater. He shrugged. We have too many Hueys in the Kessel already, he said. They're becoming a problem. If the Reds want to solve the problem for us, that's fine. As we skirted the crater and moved on, I glanced down into the pit. The Hueys were jumbled in a heap at the bottom, their bodies still smoking from the bullet impacts. The damaged pack gun was pushed in on top of them, and the scene was abandoned as the columns moved on to the west. In the Halber Kessel, the dead lay where they fell, or were dragged to one side of the track and left among the trees. I saw some bodies being thrown into marshes, and some being dropped into bomb craters. In my time inside the Kessel, I never saw a grave being dug or the earth being smoothed over a corpse. Our journey onward was slow, in the gathering shadows of the late evening. In this warm, dusty air, the sights, sounds and smells of the Kessel were stamped on my senses with a dreadful clarity. Inside the panther turret, the air was heated and rank with fuel and explosive, the transmission churning in the hull floor below the turret cage. We dumped our spent 75mm shell cases from the collection box below the gun, throwing them out of the loader's hatch in the turret rear, and left all the hatches open in an attempt to ventilate the compartment. The panther's lack of a loader's roof hatch made the attempt difficult, with my torso up through the commander's cupola, I could see the two SS King Tigers lumbering behind us, still carrying their load of exhausted SS troopers. On our panzer, every centimetre was taken up with wounded men who had pleaded for a ride, who lay bandaged and clenching their fists even across the turret roof. Even our sloped front plate, with its pox and dents from enemy rounds that did not penetrate, was draped with men holding on by their feet to the front track covers. Explosions were all around us, rumbling in from the perimeter of the Kessel, and random artillery shells exploded in the tree canopy sporadically. We had to bulldoze our way past a row of Luftwaffe trucks which were abandoned in the road, fuel siphons still hanging from their gasoline tanks. In the midst of this great crisis, these trucks were loaded with paintings and silverware that seemed to be taken from churches, the contents tipped out by those passing on foot and cast aside in their search for the necessities of fuel, water and ammunition. A large crater beside the track was full of corpses, troops and civilians, adults and children, thrown in without order or ceremony. The smell of decay made my stomach bunch as we passed. In an area of marsh in a forest clearing, the green surface of the bog was dotted with vehicles that had been pushed in away from the road. Among them, a superb. Jugged panther, tank hunter vehicle was sunk up to its roof, with birds already settling on its cupola. We glimpsed through the trees an area of open meadow land in which an American flying fortress bomber was crash-landed, with its belly sunk into the ground and its tail fin as high as the trees. The meadow was being shelled, and although we were tempted to explore the plane wreck for possible fuel or supplies, we watched as the shell bursts straddled the great aircraft and then hit it, blowing its fuselage to pieces in towers of flying metal. 
The shell bursts moved into the trees among us, and for a minute the forest was full of the screams of civilians between the detonating rounds. When the barrage moved away from us, it left a line of cars on fire, dead civilians scattered in the undergrowth, and then the columns of vehicles and walkers began moving on again. All around us, civilians and troops begged for a ride, for water, food, medicines and directions. Nobody knowing exactly where their friends or their units were. Some troops remained in units or groups with their officers, but many were now making their way west without leaders, combining together as the journey demanded. Money seemed to have no value in the Kessel. I witnessed a staff officer offering a wallet full of Reichsmarks to a Hanamag driver in return for a ride. The offer was rejected with a curse, but the driver took on a civilian couple who paid with a gold ring. The only viable currencies were gold, water, gasoline, food and morphine. These were the things that the people of the Kessel held dear to their hearts. Order had broken down, and discipline, where it was enforced, was brutal and arbitrary. At one stage in this sector, we passed what appeared to be a panzer maintenance workshop set up beside a barn. I saw first the large steel gantry which was used to lift turrets and engines from our panzers, a tall steel frame on wheels which rolled over the top of even the heaviest panzer. I was desperately relieved to see this maintenance site, as the final drive transmission in my panther was in its final stage of service. The huge power chain only lasted for 800 kilometres, and mine had passed 900 in the entry into the Kessel. The steel casing in the forward hull was leaking oil badly, and I could hear the mesh slipping in the gears as the driver sought to control it. If the system jammed in combat, it would surely finish us all. Did we have time to replace it, if a replacement was, by some miracle, available here? I saw a panther already parked under the gantry crane, and three mechanics standing on its forward hull, looking down at the transmission cover. I knew the procedure well. The forward transmission on the panther, positioned in the front hull driving the front wheels, required the mechanics to remove a rectangular plate in the hull roof above the radio operator and driver's heads. This plate, part of the armour sheet, was unbolted and then lifted clear with the crane. The mechanics would swarm into the exposed hull, freeing the entire transmission from its mountings and then lifting that out as well. The new final drive would be lowered in, the machinery so bulky that it had to be swung down through the space a millimetre at a time to ensure that it passed through. While this was going on, the engine deck at the rear would be opened and the armoured grills taken out. The complete Maybach engine would be hoisted out by the crane and a new one installed in the armoured box inside the engine bay. The whole process could be completed by skilled mechanics in a day, leaving the Panther ready to travel another 800 kilometers before the entire engine and transmission had to be replaced again. And so, when I saw the gantry crane in place over this Panther beside the barn, and the three mechanics standing there on the hull, I expected this operation to be underway, but I saw no sign of the spare parts, which were usually strewn around the service area. There was only the panther with the crane overhead and the men standing on the deck. Then I realised that the men were connected to the crane, with lines stretching from their necks to the steel girders. The men, in fact, had ropes around their necks, ropes strung up to the crane. I shielded my eyes to see what was happening there. The panther under the crane revved up, spewing out fumes, and then moved backward rapidly a few metres. The men on the front deck were left dangling, their feet jerking and their bodies convulsing as they were hung on the ropes. The panther commander turned to look at them, and then turned to face forwards, as the panzer revved again and moved away down onto the forest track. The panther bore the markings of the SS Panzer Corps. Time was pressing and we could not stop to examine the scene. But as we passed, I did observe that the three men, swaying on their nooses as their bodies went limp, were in Wehrmacht Panzer Mechanics uniforms, the oil-stained overalls I had seen so many times. Around each man's neck was a placard, with writing which I glimpsed before we moved off. This man helped the Reds, by refusing to help the Waffen-SS. When I glanced back, 
The gantry of the crane was full of ravens. The Kessel was not the place to make protests or complaints, or to debate the question of martial law. It was the place to keep moving, and keep your mouth shut, and listen to the groans of your transmission, not the sounds of the wounded or dying. By shouting out requests for directions, we made our way through the gathering gloom into an area where panzers and other armoured vehicles were dispersed among ancient oak trees. There were a trio of Hetzer tank destroyers, these useful little vehicles being worked on by their crews, and a unit of Panzer IV vehicles. The Panzer IVs were in bad shape, their mesh armour screens buckled and torn, and their engine hatches emitting brown smoke. One was being towed by a captured T-34 chassis used as a tractor with no turret. That sturdy Russian panzer had travelled how many kilometres, and changed hands how many times, and it served whoever drove it reliably, with no complaints. We edged past these vehicles, still with our load of wounded and trailing our column of followers on foot, until a solitary Ketten Hund military police officer directed us forward to a clearing point where information would be available. By the time we finally pulled into this point, darkness was gathering, and our engines were overheating badly again. The SS King Tiggers moved away at walking passer, led by guides on foot who had cable phones connected to the drivers, seeking their SS Panzer Corps unit which had its elements in the forest to the north. The capo and his gunner went to confer with the other panzer officers. We on my panzer opened the engine grills and checked over the Maybach as it gurgled and clattered in the twilight. All around us, people on foot were preparing to pass the night. People's behaviour was becoming unpredictable, and it seemed that many wanted to drown out their fears. Among all the cries of the wounded, the sound of improvised drinking parties was clear on the breeze, complete with mournful singing and the chinking of bottles. Some men and women were going into the shadows as couples, and the sounds of their copulation were clear to hear. The sound of people desperate to find some distraction, some suspension from the Kessel. One woman, a Luftwaffe flak worker, did not bother to find a discreet place, but accepted a Waffen SS man on the ground between the trees, her eyes blank as she stared up over his shoulder. We shook our heads at her audacity, but truly, who could blame her, because who knew how long their life would last, or their body would remain unscarred? A parachute flare ignited high above us, and its lunar light showed the whole scene in sharp relief. Behind the lucky SS man, others were waiting to take his place. The Reich had come to this condition now. How much further would it fall? It was around 11pm, and the sky was at times as bright as day as the flares drifted over the trees or lines of tracer twisted overhead to strike the forest some distance away. The sound of combat along the perimeter of the Kessel was loud now, and it seemed that the Reds were drawing the noose tighter all the time. Groups of wounded soldiers came limping through our positions regularly, pleading for medical attention, or knots of civilians pushing their wounded on handcarts, telling us in wild voices that the Russians were getting closer, always closer. One civilian woman shot herself with a pistol, and her dead body lay among the trees, near the Brazen Luftwaffe girl and the eager SS men. The capo returned, and with him, the leaders of the other armoured units drawn up in this part of the forest. They stood near our panther for a few minutes, talking in low voices, and then dispersed. The capo called us together, away from the milling foot soldiers, in the channel between our two panthers, with the great dish wheels on either side of us. Our drivers ran their hands instinctively along the track links as they listened, mentally assessing the tension of the track length. A green flare exploded above the treetops, casting a jagged light across us as it floated downward. The Kessel is small but crowded, the capo said without emotion. There could be a hundred thousand troops inside here, and maybe twenty or thirty thousand civilians. The Reds have fresh troops stationed around us, with new armour, and they're pushing in all the time. In one day or two days, the Kessel will surely fall. He looked between the panzers at a group of civilian women and children, asleep in the carcass of a truck that had become stuck between two trees. 
The children were asleep on top of the women, their faces lit by the swaying green flare light. With that colouring, their bodies already resembled corpses. Those in the pocket who can break out will break out now, at midnight. In forty-five minutes, Herr Lieutenant, I said. Our fuel, in forty-five minutes, the capo nodded. We will fight through a place called Halbe. That is the village immediately to the west. The Reds hold it, but we have a lot of panzers concentrated in a small zone. We will punch through Halbe, into the flat land on the other side, and cross the north-south autobahn at Baruth, or near there. After that, it is forty or fifty kilometres to the positions of the Twelfth Army, who are ready to receive us. We will pass through the Twelfth Army corridor and reach the River Elbe. We know that the Elbe is held by Americans on the west bank. We will be taken prisoner in the west, in the American zone. We know why this must be done. Germany needs us after the war ends, and if we are captured by the Russians, we will not see Germany again. The green flare overhead caught in the treetops and set light to the foliage. At the same time there was a shriek of descending shells, and we threw ourselves flat between the panthers, trusting to their steel to fend off the explosions. Looking up, I saw the truck full of women and children fly into pieces, with bodies whirling through the air in the flashing light. I pressed my face into the ground and dug my fingers into the earth, as the panthers rocked in the bombardment and the stink of explosive and smoke enveloped us, the screams and cries of the wounded over the echoes of the detonations. When that was over, and the artillery rounds stopped falling, I stood up, unwilling to face the sight of the blown-apart truck. The capo was already on his feet, staring at the wreckage. The civilians were dismembered, lying in dark pools in the green light of another flare. Nearby, the Luftwaffe woman and her SS lover were also dead, their bodies jumbled together in a smouldering pile, her eyes still blank and open. We started the panzer engines. The way to the breakout point was marked by Ketten Hund, military police, men and panzer officers, holding masked flashlights and keeping all pedestrian traffic off the forest tracks, by force if necessary. We saw one Ketten Hund kick an encroaching infantryman out of our way and then shoot him with his MP40, when the man fought his way back onto the road. Whole carts and wagons were tipped over to clear the roadways, their civilian owners watching us mutely in the light of the overhead flares and the flashes of explosions from the perimeters. We passed under an oak tree burning like a brazier, surrounded by the bodies of wounded troops who had been sheltering under it when a shell struck. Our way was lit again by the flames of a burning aircraft which scraped the treetops and then crashed to our right in a ball of flames that resembled the morning sun. We followed two of the Hetzer destroyers, and when one of them was hit by a falling tree and immobilised, we bulldozed it out of the way with our front plate and simply carried on. Behind us was a jumble of armoured elements, all racing for the breakout point, and behind that we knew that there was a dense column of foot soldiers and civilians, people in wagons, cars and trucks, all desperate to follow the armoured spearhead through Halbe and out to the west. The plan for the breakout was crude, it had to be, because the Reds were crushing the pocket around us, minute by minute, metre by metre. The first blows would be struck by the King Tigers of the SS Panzer Corps, supported by the remaining armour, artillery and panzer grenadiers from the 21st Panzer. The SS boys are desperate to be the first ones out of the Kessel, the capo had said to us with a wry smile. They know there's no prison for them not even in Siberia. Any SS who falls into red hands is shot or clubbed to death. We can rely on them to lead the way. I could see the flashes of our artillery firing through the trees on either side of the road. The gunners were under orders to fire off all their rounds, then smash their gun breech blocks and race for the breakthrough point on foot. The fuel tanks of their trucks had been drained to provide gasoline for the panzers. Ahead of us was the capo's panther, his exhausts trailing flames, and beyond him the stretch of open country that led to Halbe itself. I could see that fighting was already erupting out there, beyond the screen of the forest. 
Bursts of flame, drifting flares and the starburst explosions of rockets lit up the open heath in spasms of light. I slid down into the cupola, sealed the hatch, and held on as we lurched out of the Finnell Forest track out into the heath. Through the periscopes, I saw the church tower of Halbe Town illuminated against a curtain of flames. Whatever was happening in that small town, the place resembled a medieval inferno, full of sparks and fires. Our panther rolled across the heathland, smashing apart stationary cars and trucks that were strewn in the open. The flares overhead gave a light that varied from dusk to bright sunshine, making my eyes constantly adapt and readapt to the intensity. In one such flash, I saw the capo's panther run over a motorcycle and sidecar and send the whole machine flying through the air behind its tracks. The motorcycle span towards us, blocking my vision as it crashed onto our turret before disappearing. We slammed down into a sudden defile, and I cursed out a prayer that this was not an anti-tank ditch. As we clawed up the other side, I saw Tracer flash past us, and then we were hit twice on the glacis plate as we levelled out. There were red pack guns down there around the village, and the decision for us was whether to halt and fire on them, or to keep moving and present a rapid target. The capo had no doubts. I saw his panther sway and lurch as he approached the town in a ragged zigzag, with Tracer flying past him at each turn. With a few hundred metres to go, we had to slow down to pick our way between craters and ditches which would trap us for sure. In this zone, we came to a king tiger that was immobile in a crater, its nose slumped down and evidently stuck fast. Its huge gun barrel was elevated so that it could fire on the packs and it was maintaining a storm of fire on those positions. As we went past this stranded panzer, I saw it struck on the side of the turret by a tracer round and then by another. The whole 70 tons machine lurched, its hatches flying open and emitting towers of flames, until one final explosion from inside lifted the entire turret off the hull and sent a sphere of red flames boiling up above us. Lit by this fire, we presented an easy target, but within a few seconds we were literally on top of the surviving Russian Paquet guns, too close for them to fire over open sights. The packs were dug in along a series of emplacements before the town, and the advance wave of King Tigers had already mauled them badly. In the chaotic light of the flares, I saw that several guns had been run over and crushed by panzers, their barrels and wheels reduced to a jumble of steel and their crews dismembered around them. One pack was still intact and surrounded by living men, and we halted with a great screech of metal to let our gunner lay his sight on it. At a range of 50 metres, we used one high explosive round to demolish the emplacement. Some of the red gunners, outlined against the flames from the town behind them, raised their hands in surrender. My gunner shot them down with his coaxial MG, and we rolled forward into the outskirts of the town itself. My gunner shot them down with his coaxial MG, and we rolled forward into the outskirts of the town itself.